Welcome to Entropy to Work, a podcast about technology, engineering, and future. My name is Thiago Ebel, and I am your host. Not a lot of housekeeping from the previous episodes today, other than thank you for your support. You who listen to these interviews, give me feedback, recommend content, and recommend it for friends and colleagues. This makes it this uh, side project very much rewarding. Today's guest is a mechanical engineer specializing in pistol engine design and development. In his spare time, he researches and writes about Second World War era engine technology and assists organizations restoring wearbird engines. Well, it's a very humble way that Mr. Caelan Douglas describes uh, who he is in his website. He's the author of the amazing book, The Secret Housepower Race, Western Front Fighter Engine Development. It is a very educational and beautifully illustrated book that about the technological race that happened during the Second World War. The amount of research and quality in the book is just amazing, but also the way Calum's put the book together in a timely in logic order and also telling the stories of the engineers behind those developments on both sides of the war is just amazing but don't take my word for it take a look in some of the reviews online also when you get some people like james allison technical director of mercedes amg petrona formula one team doing the forward and mentioning how his whole team was fascinated about some of calum's talk and his understanding of the of the topic, uh, you understand why this book became such a big deal. And well, not surprisingly, the man behind the book is absolutely fascinating as well. So, <laughs> what was supposed to be just a short episode uh, ended up being uh, we end up talking for two hours straight and turn off with the feeling that we barely scratched the surface. This is why I'll be breaking this episode into two. But the first one is where we talk with Kalem, uh, technical and academic background, professional experiences, and some thoughts on current engineering challenges. The second part is where we actually talk about the book, how he ended up writing it, uh, the research that involved, uh, some of the interviews he did, and some of the main lessons for it, not just uh, engineering lessons, but let's say... Um, personal lessons, human lessons that we can get for it. So I can recommend the book enough and also the author. But yeah, I guess that's enough introduction. I had a lot of fun this episode and I hope Calum is back on the podcast soon. So now I bring you Mr. Calum Douglas. We go here. I am with Mr. Kalen Douglas. Kalen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. It's really nice to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm having a little bit of a fan moment here because I have the book and it is with your sign actually. And that's I'm my, like, that's oh. my my that's my favorite version, the one you've got there. So yeah, it is really pretty. It's uh so this was the first one that myself and my wife agreed to have in the living room. Because I was trying to convince her to have a to have a turbo charger in the living room, and she was not quite buying it. But this one is the part that you know. Usually, the living room looks like my wife, you know, all the decoration. But this is, you know, your book is right in the in the middle of the living room because it looks pretty. It's not really <laughs> cool, but it's it looks pretty as well. <laughs> so, well, we're gonna let's not jump start. I'm super excited to talk about you, but let's not talk about the book yet. It's how. I met you, actually, I saw the book first, and then I went around on LinkedIn to stalk you because I just found it fascinating. Uh, so let's go by parts. First, a little bit more background. I guess you can define who you are right now. You're a writer, you're a speaker, you're also a very seasoned engineer. But please introduce yourself, how you introduce yourself, please. Oh, that's a difficult one, I suppose. Um... It is. Sorry, it's a little bit off script. Just came up with that. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, um, I guess I'm an engineer because that defines so many different things that I do. So mm. it's kind of hard to get out of that one. 
I can't really <laughs> pretend um, I'm anything else. I think um, I think when I was about four years old or something like that, I think my dad got me a whole load of um, planks of wood and nails and a hammer. And he said he just left me in the room for about, I don't know, an hour. And he came back and I, I had just nailed all the boards together in some huge, ridiculous <laughs> pile. And, um, <laughs> And then I think the next year, I, I this is something I hear from a lot of people. I think the next year, um, he had quite an expensive um, hi-fi. And I think I took it, the whole thing apart when I was about five or six. And um, obviously, I didn't know how to put it back together. <laughs> so it was kind of one-way process of, um, okay, that interesting sounds come from this box. What's in the box? And I had to take the whole thing apart. So... Um, I don't always like to define people by their job, but um, I think in this case, it's kind of the other way around. I wouldn't define myself by my job. I am who I am. And it's just that in the world we live in, that's the job that people like me go and do to be a mechanical engineer. So, But you'd um, be the same, even if that was not your job, that's probably how you would still introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So... Um, I, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one because a few years ago, I would have said, um, you know, it's a pretty good career choice to uh, describe yourself as uh, a powertrain designer for combustion engines. But now that's a more perilous statement in terms of mm. future proofing your career. That's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. um, but that's still on my LinkedIn profile. I've put powertrain design. <laughs> um, because th that, that's that, that's what I do, and um, that's not to say that's the only thing I do. In fact, um, I, I work freelance now. I have done for many years. I, I don't um, have a nine-to-five job. Mm -hmm. and, um, a lot of the projects I've done are, are nothing to do with combustion engines at all. So um, I've done electric motor test rigs, uh, car chassis all kinds of stuff so that's really um, cool that was really cool i guess uh, at some point we're gonna we're gonna get there in the podcast as well because i'm i'm curious for that but yeah it's i found really cool that you do that because i do the same every now and then a couple of friends especially you know my family would be like you know we're in a family dinner stop talking about work and I'm like being an engineer is not really what i do is who i am so it's that it's it's <laughs> what I find interesting, what I do in my free time as well, just like you is like it's not a button that I can turn it off. It's just like, yeah, that's what I like to discuss and, and do. So yeah, that's that's really cool. <laughs> but talking about a bit about your background, you know, in researching a little bit about you, I found pretty interesting that you are a, a welder first for aerospace and then you went to university and in my own experience, I I had just that one year gap where I was studying something else and then I went to mechanical engineering. And even for myself, instead of going to university at 18, I went to 19, I already felt that there was like a huge gap between myself and people that just came from high school. I almost felt like I did a conscious decision to be here and not it's just like, you know, the next step. So I can only imagine for you after, you know, working for some for a couple of years, that was like even bigger. And I almost, and that's one of my questions. I, I wonder why, because I mean, I know some welders that do pretty well financially in their life, especially if you go to work in oil and gas and stuff. So what made you come back to, you know, came back to to the academic world for a while? Um, welding's pretty cool. Um, I did that for almost six years. So it was kind of more it than that. Really cool. It was more than just a kind of little experiment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what I would say is it depends why you're doing it. Um, if you just love the process of creating something from blocks of metal and then you end up with a product, you can probably spend your whole career doing that very happily. Mm -hmm. um, but I kept finding myself getting distracted. 
Um, so uh, what I used to do was um, heat exchanges mostly. Mm -hmm. So um, the first company I worked for was very interesting because they they made their own um, computer controlled brazing oven. So most places who make heat exchanges they they buy the actual matrix from a supplier and they just weld the you know the fittings for the air or the water flow on the end and charge you a lot of money but they mm -hmm. don't actually make they don't make the actual fins and the tubes and join them together but this company wow. did and um we used to have a lot of problems um we have to spend a lot of time hand repairing them and i would go and talk to the guy who ran the the ovens and say oh you know why why is this end really bad and this end seals really well and he would say oh well you know sometimes they go a little bit further down the oven than this way and this end gets a bit too hot and it braises really well this end doesn't and i would go back to my welding bench and thought why aren't these things going in the middle of the oven that's crazy this <laughs> why aren't we doing this how is this even you know and after doing that for about five years, I thought, you know what, I'm a little bit more interested in in what's going on than just building the component. And mm -hmm. um, it got me into a lot of trouble at work. I, <laughs> I can I, imagine. Yeah, yeah, a lot of trouble. I would I would go into the office, uh, the boss's office, and I would say uh, I'd come in with one of the heat exchangers and say. What are you doing? Look, I've spent two hours repairing this, and it's because it's not going in the oven the right way. The thermocouples aren't in at even points. The, the, there's supposed to be a circulation fan in the oven to keep the temperature even. You're not using it. We're spending all this, wasting all this time. And um, the manager of the company had designed all these systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, with his son, who did the, the software programming. Yeah. Um, so th this was not a popular um, kind of uh, hobby uh, to come in and tell him that we could be doing things better. This was not well oh, received. Okay. I can absolutely imagine, especially because at this point you might be 19, 20, 21. So it's not as that yeah. were, the guy who's the manager of the company wants to hear from like a young guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the... The point when I really realized that I needed to go and be an engineer, I think, is when I, I went and told um, one of the other senior engineers who were running the company, a different section of it. Um, I said, you know, I spent five hours last week hand repairing all these parts and it's not necessary. And I said, did you know, for example, that um, you're not using thermocouple wire? for the thermocouples and he said what do you mean i said well you have to use proper thermocouple wire because you've got three meters of cable when it comes out the oven and you're using just like television antenna wire i said if you don't use thermocouple wire it's not corrected for the temperature variation between where the oven is and the computer, because you've got several meters of cable, right? So if you don't mm -hmm. use thermocouple wire, you get incorrect readings. And um, he looked at me and he said, he said, I, I don't think you should be a welder. <laughs> <laughs> that's a and, really good um, insight. That, uh, that is a really good that, insight. That's not, um, that's not an insult to welders, um, because I can tell you right now, um, the vast majority of engineers with master's degrees and PhDs and whatever you like, they will never be able to weld anything. It's really ah. tough. So I'm, oh, not, yeah. I'm not making fun of welders. Most people won't be able to do it. If you don't have um, really good hand-eye coordination um, and patience, um, you, you won't be able to do it. So that's yeah. not a, it's, it's not, I'm not making any kind of comparison on levels. It's purely, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's purely based on if your interest is in the component or if your interest starts expanding into the processes that are used and what's mm -hmm. happening in, a, around you, that's the difference. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like comparing the guy who makes the paint and the guy who is a painter. So the guy who's a welder is almost like an artist. It's nothing wrong with being an artist, but it is a 
a choice. You want to do that. And now if you want to make different colors and different pints and different brushes, that's that's just a different occupation. And yeah, I get it. Yeah, and it's really interesting. It's really fascinating. As I said, I, I met some welders in my life, especially in the oil and gas industry. And yeah, and like we're not even talking about, you know, making a, di a difficult life financially as well, because I, I know some, you know, working from, you know, doing some pipelines underwater. They were like really well in their life, really, really well. So <laughs> cool. So you went to university and I guess there you already started getting involved with uh, motor racing, with the university competitions and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I had about three universities in my short list. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was um, Brunel, Hertfordshire and Oxford Brooks mm -hmm. and um, on paper Brunel was um, definitely the best engineering university mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the um, level of theory there is would have been more rigorous mm -hmm. than either, either of the other two mm -hmm. um, it's it, it has a very very good reputation uh, it, the clue is in the name <laughs> Brunel. Yeah, absolutely. it's, it's yeah. very very good um, but what happened to me is I went on the open day to Brunel and um, there was a very impressive lecture by uh, I think the lady who was the uh, she was a very very senior engineer she was there I think more or less the head of the department um, mm -hmm. I'm sh sure she's um, probably a lot smarter than I am um, but she got a question from one of the other guys in the audience and I think he was probably fairly similar to me in what he was looking for and he asked something like um do we get to learn how to machine components in this degree program mm -hmm. and she gave really quite a dismissive answer it wasn't to say oh we don't have time for that or we're not prioritizing it it was quite dismissive and mm -hmm. she, I can still remember what she said. Um, she said, we're here to train the engineering managers of the future, not machinists. And I thought, wow. straight wow. away, straight away, I thought, I'm out. This, mm -hmm. uh, um, you've got a great program, and I'm sure you're going to do a great job churning out the people you want to churn out, but that's not what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So um, it was halfway through the open day and I turned around to my father uh, who was sitting next to me and I said, we're going. And he said, what? We've got <laughs> two hours to go. I said, no, we're going. And um, we just got up and left like uh, halfway through the open day. I said, no, that's it. There's hmm. no way. So that's that's really cool. That's um, really cool. Uh, I went to Oxford Brooks and it's obviously much smaller and uh, much newer and it's not a what they call a red brick university, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but but um, it obviously had a more practical slant, and mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really important for me um, as a kind of um, bridging point between the start of my career and academia I, I didn't want as a welder to go into a situation where practical trade was regarded as a disadvantage mm -hmm. um, because i regarded that as an advantage for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i had to find a philosophical match between what i wanted and the, the, is, of the department this is so cool and i guess it goes a little bit to what i mentioned before that you went a little bit more mature. So you actually made that conscious decision, which is really cool. I didn't. I went to a university in Brazil that was regarded as the best mechanical engineering degree in whole Latin America at the time. I was like, that's the one I'm going in. And again, not disregarding, it opened the whole, whole world for me, but I really resonate with what you just said. I was a bit disappointed, especially you know, as a kid, my dream was to be a scientist. And then I went there, worked in a lab, and it was boring. Like, you know, really researching into something that had nothing to do with it. 
you know, and like stuff that would never actually see the light, would never really have any application, but it's almost like just for the sake of uh, of science, it's like that's my that's why I didn't do physics. That's why I wanted engineering. I wanted something like real that is going to be in a machine one day, and uh, it was really disappointing for me. But yeah, that's that's really cool. That's really cool that you made that so, conscious decision, and clearly think, you paid off. Yeah, I think. Um... It, it's not a it's just a compromise though it, it works both ways and um my my main professor at university once said and this is a horrible generalization but there's some truth in it mm -hmm. um, he said um with regards to his experience in industry that basically um you can either employ uh, a guy with a doctorate and you spend he, this is his description, not mine. Um, mm -hmm. You spend five years teaching him common sense, or you, <laughs> you can, or you can hire a machinist, and you're going to have to spend five years teaching him mathematics. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a balance. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I've because I chose a more practical route. I've had to spend a lot of time teaching myself mathematics after I graduated, mm. um, and that's not a criticize. It's not a criticism of the program. It's that it's a more practically orientated study program. Mm -hmm. And um, if I had studied engineering at um, Loughborough or Cambridge or Oxford, mm -hmm. I would probably have graduated with those mathematical skills mm -hmm. and i've had to teach myself them after graduating because i picked a more practical program yeah um, yeah so I see what I mean. yeah it's it's a balance um but in my view once you get into commercial work um you're not going to get um usually an opportunity to get those practical skills because you're you're going to go into a design office and what they need from you is drawings mm -hmm. by a certain date or you're in trouble and yeah. you can't you can't go to your boss and say I, I really like cnc machines can i spend a couple of days next week using them unless you're working for a really small company and you're very lucky mm -hmm. but um, if you're working in a commercial environment, if you work your way into the right job, um, you, you can pick up a lot of theoretical skills because if you end up in CFD or modeling or analysis, um, you're, you're going to have to. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can say to your boss, uh, hey, uh, there's a conference on automation next month um can i go and you'll sit and you know you you can do that stuff so um my view was that the, the practical stuff i had to get in um before mm -hmm. going into work outside of of university because i knew that that wasn't going to happen um otherwise you're um, absolutely right but on the other hand and you can totally see how you approach your career it's uh, having that kind of practical experience almost give you like a lens of how you see the same problem because you having that background, you see the problem differently. So, you know, working as a tool machinery engineer, for instance, and I came from a much more theoretical background. So many times I came up with a design that took one more seasoned engineer look at it and was just like, yeah, we cannot manufacture this. I was like, but. The efficiency is so good, but there's no way to manufacture that. So it's a, I see what I mean, and it's it definitely opens a door uh, for the rest of your career that I, yeah, I, I don't have that much myself. So I, but I know people who does and just have that that practical feeling of looking at something and just like, not sure you're gonna be able to do that. Yeah, that that definitely happens. Um, I mean, I think. I think the the ideal thing is to have a, a bit of both. Um, I think if you, a lot of people are talking about optimization, especially in CFD now and uh, structures as well. 
mm-hmm. and um, some people uh, I don't agree with this even basically say what's the point in an engineer I've got you know opti strut or something like that mm-hmm. um, I just employ someone to put loads into a blob and the opti strut will tell me what the what is the best shape is mm-hmm. so what are you even here for um and um i had an, a slight argument with someone on linkedin about this who, who was talking about i don't think optistrut but just optimization software mm-hmm. i said well i said well that's great um you know how much a license for optistrut costs just one you know, and usually you you need more than one or multiple cores to actually make that into like uh, via, viable um, inside a project. Uh, the you, your company can only afford that stuff if you're, you know, a big company. If if you're not a um, a Formula One team or a major automotive manufacturer or in big aerospace company, you, you can't afford the design office with. 20 seats of OptiStrat and all the other software that you've got to have. Um, mm-hmm. So that solution only applies to a very small um, number of engineers who are actually out there doing things. Um, and, and even in that situation, Colin, uh, most of the times, like it, it is still a software. It's not a person. So if you put garbage in, it's going to come garbage out. So even to be able to use that kind of software, it's not that, oh, it's a magical thing that you put there, uh, you know, you put your problem there and magically come up with something. Putting the right parameters and knowing what to look for, or even having the, uh, a good base case, that's already a big one. Yeah, I, it often, you know, annoys me, people who put so much like, oh, CFD is the solution. Yeah, it's analysis. You still need to make to have a design in order to perform a CFD in something. It's not a, It's not magic. <laughs> well, there's a couple of interesting things. One is um, I, I'm not criticizing Optistrat. You can do some pretty crazy stuff, and yeah, I, yeah. I know I, I know it's used in F1 to optimize mm-hmm. stuff, and it works. So I'm not going to pretend it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But if you look at a lot of the structures um, that are developed with it, and you know, there's all the time stuff posted on LinkedIn. You know, people say, "Look at this magic thing." Mm-hmm. And um, what you notice is, although there are some uh, refinements, basically, if you look at what you get with OptiStrat, um, you get triangles. <laughs> and you think, okay, why do you get triangles? And then you think, well, that's that's basically the, the stiffest basic element. Of course, everything ends up being triangles. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you can look at the OptiStruct stuff and say, well, that's very clever, but you can probably get 90% of that just with first year mechanical engineering vector analysis of mm-hmm. point loads to point loads and stiffening with a triangular structure. So, mm-hmm. you shouldn't look at this OptiStruct stuff and think, oh, this is uh, some magic from above um how could we ever do this without the software it's ultimately <laughs> it's basically triangulation with some refinements mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. if you're in formula one when you're after a percent gain of 0.1 percent and that's worth ten thousand dollars or something um it's worth having it um but if you're in your industry um you you don't want to pay ten thousand dollars for a 0.1 percent improvement you can probably pretty much do it just by thinking about it and putting the point loads in and connecting them up with lines mm-hmm. you're pretty absolutely much. right um, yeah, you're and absolutely also right. um from the point of view of cfd optimization um there's a lot of good stuff um some of which I, I can't really talk about now because I'm a Siemens software partner and I'm not really supposed to be talking about other software systems, but mm-hmm. um, there are open source software systems which you can use uh, to do CFD optimization with even. And many people do it, yeah, yeah. And I it, it, it's, it's, um, it's really good um, and it works, um, but 
a lot of it is done by linking parameters to the CAD model. So you've got a parameterized CAD model and you're going to vary such and such parameter linking it to the optimization mm -hmm. system. And that's great. But as we all know, even a really good CAD model um, will break. So for example, if you're looking at uh, the angle of two pipes and the gas flow, and mm -hmm. you're trying to optimize for something, um, unless the geometry is the kind of really simple stuff, which people use for correlation cases, which have basically no application in real world because no one ever makes straight pipes that join here. And you know, it's always something in a real machine, it's gonna be complicated. So the yeah. problem is what usually happens is um, you can change the angle so much and then one of the fillets will fail and the CAD model breaks. So you kind of have to know a range over which parameter you want to change to go into the optimization. And if you have no idea what you're doing, you don't know what the range is. Um, so what are you what are you going to do? All the optimization will tell you is um, basically what is the least awful version of the thing you have decided that you think is a reasonable solution mm -hmm. um, and quite often uh, for example in inlet ports in cylinder heads um, that's a really complicated geometry really complicated mm -hmm. and um, you can only change the port angle so much before one of the fillets break down or or so, or so on and um if you don't know what you're doing you, the cost of simulating all the options is so much that you have to be able to narrow it down a bit and so if you don't have some 1d stuff in an excel sheet where you've kind of figured out roughly what you think will work um mm -hmm. you can end up spending 10 times the amount of time with your optimization software that you mm -hmm. would have spent if you do have a reasonable grasp on a fundamental level of what you're trying to do before you go to the software. So um, that's the reason for the, the fundamental knowledge, even if in the future we all have um, free optimization software. Um, mm -hmm. is that if you know the fundamentals, um, you'll get to the solution before everyone else, because instead of doing 100 simulations, you've done maybe 10. So um, that's that's what yeah, I Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. That's really cool because like I'm, um, I, I'm not very popular as well in this opinion as well, because I'm really big into 1D models and calibrating the models and even coming back after I have a CFD and just using the, the CFD actually to calibrate my 1D model, because that's something faster and something that I, trust uh, almost even more because it's basically based on empirical models so i you know i'm i'm taking advantage of a hundred designs that was you know made for, for people much cleverer than myself and i just kind of you know make a model and base myself on there so yeah it's a uh, it's really cool what you you just mentioned that and also unfortunately it's something that you're starting to see from people going to, to the university i know there's a bunch of other topics but just to close this one a couple of times I was involved in like hiring, you know, people, but like, let's say in a jun junior level, someone that just came out of, you know, graduate programs and stuff like that. And nowadays it seems like everyone has a degree with CFD or did a, you know, a thesis on CFD and et cetera. And cool, that's a great tool, but it's not everything. So it, it's almost like, so when you go to an interview and you ask, oh, okay, you have this problem. What do you do with that? Oh, I'm going to run a, time dependent cfd and blah, blah, and like right what do you want to see there and like if this simulation is going to take a month that's probably going to run the whole budget of the project so um you know imagine we don't have the time for that what are you going to do and then the person kind of gets stuck you know and almost like my my first thought is i was like well do we have a 3d printer can we print and just see if it works first? And then we go into CFD to make like a, a fine investigation of what is going on. But like the final, the, 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 
the final decision if it works or not is build it and test it if that's working fine oh building is too is too expensive okay then we're gonna do some you know simulation so we can narrow down before but otherwise i'm just like yeah i'm just gonna build it if it works first done <laughs> yeah there's um there's a really good quote that's in my book i don't know if you've got to this point yet but um it's in a letter written by Ernest Hives, um, who's basically in charge of Rolls Royce in mm -hmm. the uh, making aero engines in the Second World War, and he's written this letter after he he got back from visiting um, Wright Field, which is in Ohio in America, and that's the kind of um, government U.S. government backed aeronautical research military center that's their main mm -hmm. kind of place and basically what had happened is that um most of their best people had got um conscripted into the military so a lot of them into the air force and um they were all you know abroad working for the air force instead of at home in the laboratory and um Hives basically went and visited them from the UK and he got back and he wrote this letter, which um, I found in the archives at Rolls-Royce. And um, I was quite nervous about showing it to people, actually, because it's pretty rude. You know, <laughs> I thought really? this is going to, I thought, oh, no, this is, this is, this is fun, but this is going to offend a lot of people. So you have to be uh -huh. really careful, to, careful about explaining the context. Mm -hmm. And basically, he came back and wrote this letter and explaining what his impressions were. And um, it's in the book, so I won't, I won't bother reading the direct quote out. Mm -hmm. But he said that they basically had incredible test equipment and they had a lot of capabilities in manufacturing that they didn't have in Rolls-Royce in England at the time. But he said he started asking people and I think this is, is still absolutely relevant for every analysis job. He said, why are you going to do the test? What are the results you'll get? Are you going to believe the results? What are you going to do with the results when you've got them? And he said, when you ask those questions, um, basically, no one really was able to give a very good answer about any of those points. So they just mm -hmm. kind of had to had all this test equipment. And, you know, for example, he said that um, they had got an engine and completely covered it in thermocouples, which is probably amazingly interesting. <laughs> the data from that's probably fascinating. But it basically said, well, OK, you've got this engine with, I don't know, 200 thermocouples. Um, why have you done this and what are you going to do with the readings and people just sort of said oh well we have thermal problems so we're measuring the temperatures and said, well okay what what then what are you going to do with it what does it mean uh -huh. uh, do you know the readings are right why have you chosen these points for read taking the measurements and he was um really scathing about it and um that's um a couple of people have completely misinterpreted that as it's some sort of england against america argument and it's not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the, his his point was um their best people had all been taken away and the people <laughs> that were left um they didn't really have that if you don't have these top experienced guys who know what's going on to guide the mm -hmm. research you can just go down these little rabbit holes and you can spend years investigating stuff and you won't be able to tell anyone what it means or why you were doing it or yeah what's the utility that's um, such a good point yeah and, you're totally uh, right <laughs> you can i think there's a lot of stuff like that it still happens um where you get the resources, but what are you doing with it? 
Yeah, I think that's a little bit where CFD is going sometimes. You have these amazing PhDs that go like into very, very fine detail into, you know, direct simulation. Don't get me wrong, some of like really useful, but like a lot you just see like, well, you spent three years doing this one simulation. What are we gonna do with that? Like, is, is it helping in anything? <laughs> yeah, Super I embarrassing mean, I mean, though, but it's like, yeah, it's it's a real problem. I think it's it's a genuine industry problem. I I've been on at least two projects, at least two, for big companies. Um, when we finished the project before the CFD results were done, hmm. um, <laughs> because we had to finish it by a certain date, and the mm -hmm. CFD turned out to be really difficult, mm -hmm. and um, we couldn't finish it in time. Mm -hmm. But we did we did the CFD because we'll be asked later. Okay, yeah. have you see have you CFD tested these parts? And we can say, oh yeah, and we put the graphs and, and so on. But they they weren't used for design feedback because mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it took too it took too long to do it, and it couldn't match the commercial constraint of the delivery date for the real parts. Mm -hmm. And that's a real shame because um, the parts would have been better with that feedback. Mm -hmm. We needed the CFD. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, it's not. I'm not saying CFD is rubbish. We need it, but if you don't organize it correctly, um, you can't get the results in time. And if you go too mad on the detail, it becomes um, commercially irrelevant. And um, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Something yeah. that I also seen in a project that I was involved in make me, you know crazy about it is that someone was actually you know there was a design that was from some sharp corners and usually cfd doesn't like that because of course you're creating a mesh and you know no silver gonna like you know sharp corners and it was not necessarily the finest mesh so they changed the design in order to have a cfd that converged and i was like this is crazy you don't you don't change your model to have results that you like it's it's you need to go the, the other way around maybe we don't use cfd maybe we use another program maybe we do something else but you're making design decisions based on my cfd cannot run on this this is crazy it was supposed to help you not to make it harder and maybe throw you into as i said a rabbit hole that we cannot really get out of <laughs> i i had to do that at least once to change the model to get it to mesh <laughs> well, sometimes you do that with stuff that you know is irrelevant. So something that I do for turbo machinery, very, very common, is just don't add the fillets. That's ne never going to work in a, you know, it doesn't exist in real life, but it doesn't actually change much from the aero perspective. So it's just like, if I'm just doing design iterations, I'm not going to bother about this at this point. It's going to, you know, I, I need to have a much finer mesh just because of that but it's, it doesn't really add much to my overall analysis. So it's just like, yeah, well, just put it out that, later. That's, that's true, but that's because you know what's going on and you know what you can mess with and it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, 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 it's, not, it's not anything major. But anyway, we are going in the rabbit hole here. They have a whole bunch <laughs> of other stuff that I want to ask you. So after university, you went to Germany, which I can only believe was really exciting because you went to work for Toyota Motorsport. <laughs> which is really cool. And I think we're going to get there at some point that part of your research you did during that time when we went to Germany and started learning more and more German. But then after three years there, you came back, you came back to the UK and you opened your own company, Scorpion Dynamics. And again, still impressive. You will serve manufacturers like Jaguar and Mercedes. So I'm just curious how that happened because it almost sounds like a dream job to go to work in motorsport and then you came back to the UK and opened your own company. Was it, I was just curious, is it you know to be closer to family, to have more freedom, to work in more diverse projects? How, how, how did that happen? Um, that's a really difficult one. There's a whole lot of different aspects to it. Um, can imagine. Some of them are very personal and I can't go into, mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the problems was timing. So um, when I joined TMG, 
they had not long been out of Formula One. And the company was in quite a big uh, transition period of, of trying to work out uh, what to do. Um, because I don't know if you've ever been inside TMG. It's, you know, it, it's um, it's old now by the standards of, you know, stuff like um, the latest F1 teams. But, I mean, it's incredibly impressive. I mean, I think it cost something like a billion euros when they built it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, they basically um, just went to places like AVL and all the rest and just said, forget the catalog. I'm going to tell you what I want and you're going to come and build it. And they just installed everything mm-hmm. that you could imagine. Every test rig. That That's awesome. These, they just had everything. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, you used to get, um, they've got bicycles inside inside the uh the the office uh, the office buildings because it's it's so huge um you you need the bicycle to to get to the other end of the, the factory wow. in, in a short amount of time you know mm-hmm. um so, uh, a lot of the mechanics would ride the bicycles around because they they want to come <laughs> and talk to you about a problem in the drawing and you know it's going to take them like 20 minutes to walk so they cycle them you just take the bike <laughs> yeah that's so cool um it's an amazing place and um, a lot of great people there, um, but I think it's a very difficult time for the company because they're having to work out what to do with a, a, a billion euro um, specialist investment, mm-hmm. investment um, when you don't have uh, an F1 budget. So that was really tricky. So I kind of came into it in the middle of this kind of chaos about what they were, mm-hmm. what they were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a lot of uncertainty and um, that was very, very difficult. And also the, uh, and I'm not going to be the only one who'll tell you this, but the mixture of German and Japanese cultures is um, in many ways uh, not optimal for engineering. (laughs) Really? Uh, No, not at all. So... (laughs) I give you give you an example. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's horrible making generalizations because people are different everywhere, and you'll find mm. all varieties in all countries. But mm. generally, um, German engineers um, like to be told exactly what you want and when you want it. And if something is wrong, they want to be told it's wrong. And if you've done something wrong, they will tell you it is wrong immediately. And they're not being rude. It's because it's, it's just, wrong. And yeah, you need to fix it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it. This is wrong. This needs to be fixed now. Okay. And the problem with that is um, the Japanese philosophy is almost opposite to that in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So... Um, if you want to tell uh, a Japanese person that there's a problem, that's immediately complicated by the fact that it depends um, on their seniority level. Okay, if it's if it, if the person is senior to you, you can't go up to them and just say something you've done is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's basically not possible. Mm-hmm. And the, the rules are a little bit more relaxed inside TMG. It's it's a kind of toned down Japanese culture. It's not as strict as it would be in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. But um, for example, if I did something wrong, um, one of my German colleagues would just come up to me and say, um, yeah, that's wrong. You need to redo it. This and this and this is incorrect. Um, you've missed out this. Um, I told you about this yesterday. You haven't done it. Fix it. Um, if I've done something wrong and my Japanese boss comes up to me to tell me the same thing, he'll come up and say, uh, yeah, I, I once uh, was in a situation 10 years ago and um, I had a 
Ike, who did what you did, but in a slightly different way, which was like this, which was also good. So have a think about that. That's his way of saying everything you've done is wrong. <laughs> so that's crazy. That's yeah, you, crazy. Can, you can get really bad communication mix-ups because uh, the Japanese method is very subtle, mm -hmm. and you, you have to be very gentle, and you can't. Um, you have to. You know, there's all kinds of authority levels you have to respect, and the German stuff mm -hmm. is very direct, so straightforward. And <laughs> if you don't know that's how it works, you can have the most awful communication problems um for the reasons i've just <laughs> outlined so this, this is really interesting because i mean i'm from brazil but in the south of brazil there's a lot of german so my family is very german and up until nowadays some stuff that let's say my wife still complains about how direct i am about some stuff when i was living abroad uh years ago when i went to australia one of my colleagues housemates was japanese and I saw that happening so many times for like small stuff. It's like, you know, he's cooking. I'm like, do you want help? It's like, oh no, not really. I can do, you know, my own. It's a lot of food, but you know, I can do it. I was like, okay. And then I left. And then it took him months to admit that like, oh, I don't like that you don't like, that you don't help in the stuff in the house. I'm like, <laughs> I offered you, you said no. She's like, yeah, but I don't really mean it. I was like, because I am like that. If I'm doing something and you come to help and I told you, no, thank you, I don't want help, I'm going to get annoyed if you help me because it's maybe something I want to figure out myself. And if I say I want help, I do want help. And it is funny that you said, and I, I never thought about this in the workplace, but you know, by my own experience, I can see that happening because it happened with me before. And uh, yeah, I can imagine in the workplace, it's uh, 10 times worse. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult really difficult um having said that it's it was a really difficult decision to leave and it made me very very sad and i had a great time there and i wouldn't take it back for anything that's cool and, um that's i good. still i still talk to my my boss there quite regularly mm -hmm. um not because i'm trying to get a job there we just I enjoy <laughs> We have some shared interests and I enjoy talking to him. It's it's uh, it's it's great. And so I think the problem I'd got to was that I liked where I was. I liked the people. I liked the atmosphere once I had understood how it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was that I think the reality of the commercial projects that they had available uh, didn't match what I had hoped it was going to be possible um, when I joined the company. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, ha I had to make uh, a decision which was, okay, I'm by that point, you know, whatever, 30, I don't know, 35 or something. Mm -hmm. I thought I'm, I'm either going to settle down here and I'm going to buy a house and have a family and I'm going to stay here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to accept this, or if I'm not going to accept it, I'm going to have to do something completely different. And so I thought, I can't accept the, the fact that I might not get to do all the kind of work that I was hoping I would get to do. Mm -hmm. And so I had to say, well, I'm either going to become one of those people who you meet every day in the cafeteria at work who's been working for the company and hates it and moans to you about everything mm -hmm. for 10 years oh this is terrible and you just think oh, you chose to be here why are you complaining <laughs> i thought either that's going to be me or i need to do something about it and um the only thing i could come up with was that i had to try something completely different which is working for myself mm -hmm. And um, that's um, that's why I did that. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I can. Uh, I don't even want to go into that rabbit hole because yeah, there's so many stuff that you just said that resonates with me in many levels. But uh, yeah, that's uh, it's cool. It's really good, and I'm, I'm I can say I'm glad you did it because maybe you wouldn't have the insights that you have right now, and it's uh, fascinating watching from the outside.